The recording has started. Hi, everybody. I'm Chris Caligari, and this is the Covert Weekly Meeting, where uh, we discuss uh, issues and topics related to Covert. Um, I have posted our meeting notes into chat. Um, so if you'd like to follow along, you may do so. Uh, if not, I'm going to share my screen and uh, you can follow along that way. Right, um, and if you could uh, add your name to the attendees list, I would be grateful. Um, we usually take a, a minute or two at the very beginning for uh, an introduction. So if anybody is new has joined us and uh, would like to say hello, now is your time. See, I'm, looking at I'm, I'm Peter Lauterbach. I'm one of the product managers here at uh, Red Hat um, and Qbert uh, OpenShift Virtualization is one of my products. Hi, Peter. Welcome to the group. Thank you. Most of us are, are Red Hat, um, but I still like to, uh, to have an introduction so we can all uh, get to know each other a little better. Um, there's a few that are non Red Hat, and uh, so it just has a more welcome feel, I think. Okay, agenda and floor is wide open, so whoever wants to talk, uh, enter an item into the list and we can begin. I have this hunch that it's going to be a very fast meeting today. <laughs> or a very long bug scrub. <laughs> we haven't bug scrubbed in a few weeks, so it might be lengthy. All right, well, let's skip the agenda and just go right to the open floor. Roman, take her away. I, I just wanted to do a brief follow up here in this meeting from last week's result from, from the first scalability SIG meeting. Um, and um, so an outcome there was uh, that a group from IBM is working on collecting the metrics with Prometheus in our Kubernetes CI clusters. And um, and then we were discussing how to get the metrics out of the Kubernetes CI clusters into, into the cluster metrics so that they can be accessed for dashboards and so on. And uh, Federico is also here. And I was just wondering how far away we are here from, uh, actually, it shouldn't be too hard to deploy the operators, the, the Prometheus operators, and providing a federation setup. I just wanted to close this gap and discuss it a little bit. I wanted to see you. How far we are here, Federico? If you are on the call, yeah, um, no, no, no progress so far in, uh, on this. I think we should uh, start by modifying, uh, uh, or I am not completely sure if Go, Go CLI has the the um, uh, proper flags in place to uh, provide access to this uh, Prometheus operator running inside the uh, the Kubernetes CI cluster. But yeah, other than that, um, it would be just a matter of, of uh, adding the manifests to, to what we deploy in the, in the Kubernetes CI cluster and yeah, just scraping that from the outside. Great, so I guess- But yeah, no, no, no progress as far as I know. So I guess we can create in project infra task for having Prometheus for federation ready in all our build clusters, right? Yeah, and, exactly. And what do you think about then creating a, a a public route where people can basically just scrape the collected metrics for the performance runs so that, I don't know, it's easy to visualize your own stuff and do the development on dashboards. Does that sound, reason, does that sound reasonable for you? 
Uh, absolutely, yeah, yeah. Having separate uh, dashboards for 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 this for this, uh, uh, yeah, makes makes total sense. With maybe even a separate uh, Grafana instance, or we can use the the common Grafana dot ci dot dot io instance. Yeah, that makes total sense. I guess that's what we're going to do. But, but Roman, I have a question, and maybe the terminology is, is you know, not the same here. I wouldn't say it's scrapping by each of the user, right? I, I think we need to have a kind of centralized scrapping. You want to suggest the possibility to access the actual data and yeah, perform yeah. analytics so, so, on top of that. So, yeah, I so as, I, as I understood it, what we agreed is that um, that you and your team are doing the Kubernetes CI changes so that Prometheus in there is collecting the data. And Federico would then, and I'm happy to help too, uh, ensure that the, the Kubernetes CI clusters can be properly scraped and by the central Prometheus so that we can visualize the collected complete data properly. Is that not what you think? Right, right, right. I, 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 yeah, yeah, it's just a, a matter of, you know, where is the border? What I meant is that I'm not sure that on the test, you, I'm not sure that you want the user to actually control how you collect the data. You only want to allow uh, the possibility to visualize it yourself, to put some... Exactly, uh, yeah. So, yeah. So, yeah. So, yeah. Right, right. Yeah. So, so, it's not, yeah. so we agree. We scrape so the data agree. and then you can do Prometheus queries, basically. Prometheus. Yeah, exactly. So you want to allow Prometheus queries. This is not scrapping. So, okay, we are... Yeah. Okay, great. So then I can ensure that we have the, the GitHub issues to to crack, to track this on the CI info side. Great. So, so for Draco, just to understand, you think that they, we will able to give people their own Grafana instance even, or just their dashboard on a centralized Grafana? Oh, at the end, just it's a, uh, the, the, the purpose is definitely to have a centralized dashboard at the end. But it's more <laughs> like, you know, when you're developing or anything, I was just thinking about giving public access or limited access to, but generous access for some people which are working on that so that they don't right, have Right, excellent. Access so they, cre they can create their own dashboards. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and then when we have good dashboards, I would just do it to the centralized Grafana. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Excellent, mm -hmm. yeah. We can do a competition, the best dashboard. <laughs> exactly, yeah. <laughs> Sounds good. Every, everybody already has a Kubevert t-shirt, so I don't know what else I can give away for a, an award for that. I, I could always use more. <laughs> <laughs> in, in any case, we are... We are Maybe we Peter can give us a CNV t-shirt. <laughs> All the, all the infrastructure that we are deploying is uh, defined by code and uh, also the, the dashboards. So we can propose PRs for defining the, the dashboard and review and uh, evolve the, them over time also. So yeah, it can be done. Hey, Roman, can you tag me on the, um, the issues? I kind of want to follow along because I think um, we're probably like even some of the stuff and like I, I could learn a little bit about how to contribute some of the stuff to CI like as we go through some more stuff in six scale. Um, I expect there'll be more things and I'm not very familiar with it. So just I think I'll probably learn a few things if I follow along the issue. Definitely. Okay. And, and sure. one, one, one thing probably we will maybe we can achieve through this work is outside, you know, the sick performance and scale and so on. Uh, how we can communicate so people can, for example, if people want to ask for additional, you know, data that we are currently even not collecting, maybe we should have a, you know, a, a good channel for that, right? Uh, other than just maybe through the, the SIG group or whatever, you know, uh, not just visualizing. If someone thinks that, you know, we are missing some information, all so I don't know how how they do that today. Just opening a PR. What what is the procedure? Yeah, honest, I see many possibilities. Creating an issue, writing to keyword table, the Slack okay. channel. I guess it's yeah. all fine with me. 
No, no, I'm, ju I'm just thinking that, you know, to make sure that it is not a kind of, a, that the SIG group at least is aware of that. So it's not going a kind of away with all the hundred other PRs and issues. I guess one limitation which you have is uh, we can't have endless channels on the Kubernetes Slack. So they normally give two channels. No, 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 yeah, yeah. CNCF, Another yeah. channel will co kill me completely. <laughs> but, yeah, okay, great. Okay, thank you, Roman. Daniel, um, you're next. Hey, um, I just wanted to give a quick heads up that we have integrated the Kubernetes 1.21 provider into the Kubeboot code base. Um, so that people can start their tests, at least locally. Um, we are still working on the lanes, so uh, that we have the testing lanes for Kubernetes 1.21 also. So that is just work in progress. But yeah, I think um, we are a little bit late to the game for integrating 1.21. But yeah, <laughs> it is like it is. Yeah, thanks for doing it. Thank you, Daniel. Okay, who's next? Crickets. Hi, this is Vishal here. Uh, if you don't mind, uh, may I introduce myself? It's my very first call, or I can wait till the end. Oh, go ahead. Okay. So well, thank you very much for uh, uh, accepting me in this community and I work for IBM. My name is Vishal. Yes, thank you. Um, so um, I had submitted one request, like if you all like, I can show the auto import functionality, uh, but that's on my OpenShift cluster, not like very, uh, say custom built uh, upstream uh, project. But as you all know, that under the hood, it's Kubert. So, like, let me know if you all want to see, and uh, I'm happy to share. But this functionality of auto import was like really cool, and I was really able to bring my entire virtualized application from source environment to my cluster in 23 minutes and 10 gig image and my application came up like super cool on my cluster. So let me know, yeah. Oh, that's that's awesome to hear, Michelle. I know, welcome to the group. Um, hope you, uh, Thank you stick around and join us for a while. Uh, it, did your demo uh, have uh, big lengths of time that we have to wait or is it uh, just a, a nice seamless um, end-to-end demo yeah it's nice seamless and in fact one is also working so like as but it takes as i said 20 to 23 minutes of importing the image so mm -hmm. if you all want to wait for that image completion then 22 minutes else i can show how i did that and then also show that uh, the working application already through that process so Depending yeah. upon how much time. Well, let's have. talk. Let's take a few minutes, and uh, and happy to um, uh, pass the screen share over to you. But let's Thanks. skip. Let's skip the um, the the image import part, so we're not waiting on uh, on meters. Perfect. Okay, I'm gonna stop sharing and uh, go ahead and share. And may I know your name, please? I'm Chris Caligari. Chris Caligari. Hi, Chris. Hi. Are you able to share? Yeah, I'm okay. going to share now. Uh, share screen. You able to see my screen? Yep. That's great. Okay. Yes. Cool. Cool. So this is the source environment. It's a, <clears throat> excuse me, VMware, 
and we have some application VMs running. So this is eStore. So this is the Red Hat Enterprise Linux 7 uh, virtual machine running on 6.7 ESXi. Um, this is where my application is installed. Now, from here, I actually did that last night. So for auto import, we have to actually shut down this VM on the VMware side and like easy click here really if you go to actions and just power off your VM. Once that po that's powered off, you are back to your OpenShift cluster. So what I did like for this uh, testing purposes, I created my namespace and uh, let me actually create a namespace here, right? And uh, show you what exactly I did. Although I'll not import it, but here say test wish create and went to virtualization, create virtual machine import with wizard. And here, I selected VMware. That's where my source is. So it's now deploying the V2V VMware controller. Once that is done, it will ask me for the vCenter. So connect to new instance. Oh, it's asking me for the IP actually. And I do have IP, although oh. <laughs> I can like just make sure you change a, your password uh, please <laughs> <laughs> yeah um so let me just so it's asking for the v center ip <clears throat> and just enter it here Okay, I have entered my IP and the vCenter username password. Okay, you can share okay. your screen again. Yep, I can share my screen again. Uh, sorry about that. Okay, so here it has connected and it's showing me all the VMs which are running. So I'm interested in eStore. It's connecting. Uh, okay, it connected here. Then, of course, we have to select the operating system. So, say Red Hat Linux, and I'm fine with 8 gig and two CPUs. Uh, next, it's, it's really that simple, right? So, just select your options with auto import. Here, you can change from bridge to masquerade or if you like bridge. It doesn't allow to change MAC address here, by the way. So that was interesting observation. So I had to actually, I wanted to remove that. So I did that in the YAML file later on, once that VM came up. Uh, then it shows the disk options. So I want the uh, read write many option because I might later on choose to live migrate within my cluster so good it's uh, taken the read write many option next uh, for now i don't need this so i'm gonna use the same credentials which i have on the source side uh, and i'm fine with all these details here import it won't import because vm is actually running there, right? So I have to power off this here. Uh, power off, power off, okay. So now it will, okay, I got this import error because I forgot to bring that VM, right? So I'll have to actually do that again, but this was the process I followed. I'm sorry, I forgot to shut down this VM earlier. So that's why I import error. But when I did this yesterday in uh, another namespace, this test, that's exactly what I did. And in 22 minutes, my VM came up here um, and I didn't do much changes apart from just editing the MAC address. 
and rebooted that VM. Uh, after that, I created a simple service here on 8080. And I created then a route from that service. And here's my sample application. It was really simple, like in 23 minutes, I had my application up and running here on OpenShift, uh, leveraging Qbert, right? So that's what I wanted to share with all of you. That's fantastic. It's really nice to see uh, such a seamless workflow. It, 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 it was indeed a great experience because, um, <clears throat> excuse me, before this, I had uh, used the word CTL man manual upload and all. And I did with six gig of Windows image 2012. The upload itself took like a lot of hours from my home connection. And my, my connection is pretty fast here in Dublin, Virgin Media. But still, it took few hours and uh, had to wait. And like if any connection is interrupted, then you like start your upload again. Mm -hmm. A lot of hours. All that was done literally in 22 minutes, 100% import done, one extra minute to create that service and route, and I was up and running. That's awesome. Vishal, what kind of application are you running there? Is that a .NET with a SQL backend? Interesting, yeah. So this one is actually the Java-based application, mm -hmm. and it has Post Postgres SQL database as oh, well. Okay some more configurations, but since you asked me that, I have successfully migrated a .NET application also mm -hmm. from the source VMware to OpenShift, but like container platform in on the Linux windows, right? Uh, sorry, Linux worker nodes, not the mm -hmm. windows workers, on Linux worker. And this .NET application, which I brought in here, that also had dependency on Microsoft IIS. It was using Microsoft SQL. Then the backend application was using uh, DICOM 4 uh, for imaging purposes, which also used the Postgres SQL and LDAP. So like these six components, mm -hmm. I moved three of them as containers and three of them as part of the VM running on Windows 2016, including that front-end .NET application, brought all those six, three VMs and three containers together in the same namespace. And I still have that application up and running on my cluster. But all that I did manually, right? Oh, that's amazing. If you would like to blog on that, we would <laughs> love to have that content. <laughs> There's, uh, I, 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 there's great interest in, uh, in the Windows world in uh, consolidating uh, into one API uh, into Kubernetes and uh, running, uh, running hybrid clouds. And so, yeah, yeah. It's, it's some of our most popular pages on the website is the Windows stuff. Yep, yep. Well, cool. thank you for taking the time to talk about that. No, thank you for giving me the opportunity, Chris. Welcome. Hey, Ezra, um, you're next. Yeah, the, this is just a simple point. Once again, if it's covered or if people do not think it's important, we can skip this. But uh, for the last, I think, few months already, I, I think at least personally, I got the impression that we probably, it would be helpful if we can, for the developer, have some few paragraphs that give the, you know, the wisdom of what we expect to have a review process on a PR, uh, because as kind of a newcomer, right, to the project, I saw completely different 
processes, reaction, the, the length of the review, the, the depth, the, the type of comments and so on. Uh, of course, there is some individual individuality in this process, but I think a, a, some high level guidelines will be good. At least this is my impression. Uh, if you have already, that's okay. I withdraw, withdraw my, my request, but um, I think it will be good. But uh, I, I bring that up just because I know this is a very delicate issue. A lot of people say, look, uh, the free spirit, you know, everyone can do whatever he likes and so on. So this is why I'm bringing it up to see if anyone at all think we, we, we need such a thing. Ooh, that's a big topic. Um, who do we have that senior? Stu, are you still there? Yes. Um... I don't think we already have any sort of canonical or canonized rule set about what uh, constitutes a good review. I mean, I, I guess it's so subjective. That's a hard thing. I don't know where to begin. Um, and because it does depend on if it's small, medium, large in terms of the content, but it also has a lot to do with is, is it an architecture change? Is there something like profoundly different about the new rules or did we, did we change something or we introducing something new? So I don't, I don't know if there's a cookie cutter set of um, rules overall. I mean, there could be guidelines in terms of what needs to be done. For instance, uh, you know, it, it's good to make multiple passes over a PR, you know, once to read it just to kind of get the general gist reread it just to, you know, to, to really uh, understand it and then, you know, kind of dig in it. Like, so to do it right, it does take multiple passes, kind of like proofreading a paper uh, of your own authorship. You don't, you don't do it one pass and go, okay, done, bye. You know, so that, that would be the one piece of advice I would give, but, it, but that's just like some, you know, th that's not concrete. So that's not what he's asking for. So I, I really don't know how to answer that other than that. Yeah, I'm, I'm the same way. Um, I feel like some uh, some pull requests are created um, very well in that um, they give guidance on exactly what's changed and how to test the changes. And then there's some like large and extra large pull requests that are just thrown over the fence and you have to interpret what is what's what's happening. And uh, of course, when uh, when the pull request is not created nicely, then it takes a lot of time to test and if you find one problem then it's going to make you uh be a lot more um critical on on the uh further along in a diff but but that's the that's the other direction and that's guidelines on how to write a good pr that's not what i'm aiming here i'm aiming towards how you should conduct a review mm. How about um, I take this one as a community organizer and uh, I, I will reach out to CNCF and see if they have any any material. Yeah, and, excellent. Uh, I'll report yeah, back yeah. in. Absolutely, thank you. You're welcome. Honestly, my, my take on this is that it doesn't matter how, but uh, we just need reviews. I mean, people just need to start reviewing. Yeah, that's another topic, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, uh, to go to the last comment, uh, if we look, uh, I, I don't have statistics, but at least the area that I was working on, uh, on many times, the actual reviewer is actually not the person that was assigned by the system. So it's either a volunteer or someone that you, uh, is probably someone approached directly and so on which means that, you know, something kind of uh, not working very well with the, also, you know, the process that we are working because uh, probably 
too few yes. people. Yeah. So, so in, oh, in order to improve that, uh, what we would have to do is uh, restructuring the code to reflect ownership. Um, on on one hand, so we work with owner files, but we basically just have a top level owner file. That's it, and it just the system then just tries to assign people which have less reviews open to something out of that list. Yeah, that's, um, that's, that's a good idea because I, I, I tend to see that there is no balance, right? A few people getting a lot of requests and probably do not, uh, are not able to meet the, the stress, right? Yeah, another issue is that um, what we're clearing for some time is that most of the features, uh, any feature which you add is basically going across all components most of the time. It's very seldom. Uh, some improvements are just in parts. But whenever you add a feature or something, it normally goes through the API, through the controllers and everywhere. And it's tricky to give very good ownership assignments there. We can, we can look into it and try to improve it. So. <laughs> And yeah, I mean, the amount of people which can do thorough reviews regarding the architecture is, is certainly still a little bit low. That's another issue. Roman, was that you talking? Yeah. Can I tag you on that? Sure. All right. Thank you. Okay, um, we're done with the open floor, I'm pretty sure. Uh, just a reminder, tomorrow, uh, same time, we have the performance and SIG meeting. Um, Ryan Pellissey will be running that meeting. Um, see our community calendar, which probably doesn't have the event yet, <laughs> because I'm still working on uh, removing that calendar from Red Hat land and getting it to CNCF land. Uh, Ryan, if you could send a reminder to the email list, if you're here, I think you're here. I thought I saw him, I guess not. Okay, then I will do it. And I'll, uh, I'll be reminding people about that meeting for a, a couple weeks since it's, it's brand new. And then let's see, let me uh, just give a quick note about events. Um, Red Hat Summit was a, a, a humongous success and there was tons of activity in uh, the community Kubert uh, k and I booth. I wish, I think we had one question and uh, it was just a simple one. But uh, I hope everybody who went had a good time. I had a good time. I thought the keynote speeches were, were really awesome. Um, then um, Stu and I um, met last week regarding all things open and we got our, we got the call for paper form submitted and uh, now we get to wait and twiddle our thumbs for two weeks while they make a decision on whether or not they accept us. Hopefully they do because uh, we all bought Raspberry Pi 4Bs and so for this demo. <laughs> and again, if uh, you would like to participate in this demo, it's going to be a, an internet distributed uh, Kubernetes cluster running Kubert and uh, virtual machine workloads. Um, participants are going to have to purchase their own uh, Pi 4B 
with eight gig of memory. It's not going to be cheap. It's going to be around a hundred dollars USD. Um, and then, uh, um, Stu will be orchestrating a demo and, uh, and probably do some Bitcoin mining on your, on your time. <laughs> Just kidding. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, we're, we're both really excited about this demo. So hopefully, uh, you guys want to participate. Um, Stu, what do you think about another uh, meeting like next week or so and uh, start getting things going? Yeah, we can do that. I think we're in kind of a dead time where we have to wait for all things open to actually you know, approve the talk. Uh, but of course, we don't want to wait too long because there's there's some ground to cover. There's some things to discover here. Yeah, definitely. And I think uh, uh, even if we don't get accepted, I think it would be really, really awesome if we uh, if we did it anyway, and to produce a video or a or a blog post. What would you say to that? Yeah, we can definitely do something along those lines. All right. Yeah, our, our big uh, our big content is uh, getting thin and long in the tooth, so we need to get some fresh stuff published. Okay, um, that's all I have. Um, I don't think anybody has any pull requests that uh, they really want to talk about. Um, we have not done a bug scrub. Um, so how about we go into that? Sure, uh, can I share your screen? Sure can. I'll stop and turn it over to you. Thank you, Peter. Thanks. I tried to go over a couple of those offline the last week. So, I mean, if you feel like you could do the same, I encourage you to do so. Just yeah, try to scrap as much as you can. Um, all right, let's start. Um, David, do you want to give a heads up about this one? Ah. No, um, or I can, I guess. Um, so there is an issue that prevents live migrations, and uh, the issue could be potentially solved by bumping the libvirt version. So this GitHub issue is just tracking that bump, mm -hmm. and more specifically, the back part of the bump on release 041. Um, so unless anybody proved this, I would just mark it as accepted. The next one, strange behavior of convert after deleting a namespace. Is there any activity on this thread? No. So somebody tried deleting convert. Stuck in terminating state. Okay, it was deleted while deploying it, more specifically. And it got into a dead vault, maybe due to the webhook. I mean, I recall this was quite common. Is uh, anybody aware of like, this one specifically? Are we still saying it? Have we figure, uh, figured out a solution for it? Okay, um, I don't know. So let's leave it for now. There's been try. PRs um, fixing that before. It had been an issue, but I thought it was fixed. Um, but I can look into this bug. Oh, that'd be awesome. Thanks, Ashley. Yep. I'll paste it in the chat so it helps you. Okay.
Docker save is not working for Vert Handler and Vert Launcher. What's Docker save? Do we care about this at all? Somebody's on off somebody's tool and doesn't it's not able to archive a, a container image. I haven't heard of that save argument. I think Roman fixed this one. It's strange that it comes to me. Oh, it, he just forgot to close. I think he has a fix for this, Roman. Probably you can see this. Okay. Um, let's ask. Then. Thanks. Okay, unexpected behavior when a VM with node selector is migrated. Yeah, I have replied him uh, because I think it was uh, he was trying uh, to figure uh, it was in the incorrect way. Ah, sorry, it's about the VM. No, I was talking about another issue. Please ignore me. Sorry. Oh no, I was hoping this is just resolved. Um, Okay, so it's, is it a bug or an RFE? Be able to migrate the VM that includes node selector. Anybody uh, familiar with this API? Like not only migrating, but migrating to a specific node. If that's what that is. Ah, no, it's a VM with node selector. Um, okay, so let me try to ask a good question. Unless we have him on the call. Um, Okay, let me try. <laughs> um, able to post VM with CloudNet without disk for CloudNet. Um, Roman, I see you commented here. Uh, we have a PR open for oh. this by Itamar. Ah, I see. Good. Um, so we can consider it accepted. Okay. VM snow bootable device. What is this about? So the serious VM does boot, but I understand following the guide from 2018, how to import VM into Covert. I've created VVPVC. OK. 
Okay. Bots are all running, but VMs can't start as new. Um, well, if nothing else, let's ask him to gather some logs. There is a clear producer there. Not selected for a word handler daemon set does not work. Yeah, that one I was meant for. Uh, I was talking about it was uh, the real issue. I think is that we don't have proper documentation for the on the subject of our infant workload pods placement. So uh, in this case, this issue was opened because. Uh, uh, because he was thinking he need to apply directly on the diamond set resource or on the deployment resource, but since we have the reconciliation, we will reconcile it back. So the proper way to do this will be from the cube root CR. So, mm -hmm. so what it it's not about make, actually. Um, shall we turn it into an like a RFA or do we want to just leave it as like? I think we'll leave it as is. Yeah. Ah, you want, to, you want to turn it to. Yeah, okay. Uh, if, if it's fine by everybody. Uh, I think we can leave this as is and let, this, let him close this file and I will open a new a new issue about that we some have lack of documentation regarding uh, the okay. node text for this one. Um, thanks for checking. Igor, right now, there's this one. Um, does anybody speak um, Mandarin on the call? Is this the one uh, regarding the kernel crash? Yeah, yeah. Uh, give yeah, me one second. I, uh, I got an interpretation on that. Uh, I think it's very it's very simple. He was just wondering why this happens every time. Um, I have to go back and text I mean there is maybe text a... messages to find his interpretation. <laughs> There may be a like meta question, and that's do we want to set a community language for the project? Because like, 
that doesn't happen often, but we cannot moderate different languages than, than, than English. We cannot really help them. So the question is, should we try to play with translator or just ask for an English version of the issue? Yeah, I mean, silence is always the worst thing. So I, I think it's a good idea to ask them to translate into English. All right. Yeah, I just, you know, I don't want to send help us like to help you. Next messages. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, a, a friend of mine speaks Mandarin. He just said it was, they wanted to know why this happens every time. It's very a very simple comment. I'm not sure, but I think there is a Chinese user group, right? Maybe we can forward it to them, probably. There is, but I think we lost them. Um, they were sending uh, they were sending us messages around December, and uh, and then it cut off. So I don't know if it, if something political happened or if uh, that meeting dissolved or what. Um, we were never able to uh, to reach out to them. Okay, that's it. I agree. The the end of quarter in twenty twenty was pretty chaotic for us and traumatic. <laughs> Ah, I'm so awkward. I just ask if they can translate it. Peter, I think it's your keyboard. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, okay. One last, and that's yours, uh, Therese, before we uh, stop oh, this. Yeah. Uh... Is this the alternative, the alternative registry one? Yeah. Yeah, uh, I created this issue because uh, I onboarded three people and um, miraculously right at the same time, Quay.io went down. And so we twiddled our thumbs all day. We weren't able to do anything with uh, with uh, Cooper because all the images come from Quay.io. Um, so hence we have a issue to publish to alternative registries such as GitHub. Um, but I mean, even if we do so, we would need some like. I don't know, mirroring or whatever to balance between those, right? Because like, if Koi goes down, we would need to switch all our docs to something else for a while, you know? Yeah, you know, I don't know. I only know Bash and <laughs> Seashell maybe. <laughs> I mean, maybe we could also create two, uh, uh, two manifests with, uh, with two different um, uh, with two different uh, backend repos, right? So some some Docker manifest and some uh, Quay manifest. But yeah, this would also be quite a bit of work, and I'm not sure to keep all this in sync would be even more a hassle, right? Yes. Yeah. Like what you suggest sounds uh, easiest to do, but maybe we should invest the energy into sending like angry messages to Quay.io to make sure that they're... <laughs> it's not going to happen. <laughs> it's, uh, they, uh, they've had multiple major outages, and it's only a matter of time before there's a data loss. <laughs> and, and then... Right. Yeah, but on the other that? hand, you, you, have, you have the, uh, the Docker rate limit, right? So this is also not ideal. Yeah. Uh, Docker Hub's going to charge on network throughput, so everybody's abandoning that that registry. Yeah, that was the primary reason why we uh, switched over from Docker to to Quay. 
Well, a, a lot of people are using uh, the GitHub registry. Uh, as you can see, we had somebody just pass through and, uh, and post a comment on it. I think GitHub repositories are also not really free, exactly. If, uh, if we do that, though, we're, uh, we have some flexibility with the CNCF. We, uh, we may be able to get under their, their account. Okay. I'm, I'm happy to look into that as, as well. We, uh, we really need to start using all of CNCF's tools anyways. Like, I didn't know that. Okay. Yeah, yeah, they, uh, they give us all sorts of neat things. Um, they actually pay for the Zoom conference. So if, uh, if a normal person was doing a, a Zoom conference like this, they would, they would get charged. But uh, up until about six months ago, we were using Red Hat's account, and then we transitioned over to the CNCF account. I was actually, I was aware that there are a couple of resources uh, provided by CNCF. For example, the FOSA chat comes from CNCF. Mm -hmm. um, and there are a couple of other things. But yeah, the, the GitHub repository, uh, I wasn't aware of. Okay, interesting. Mm -hmm. Can I so can put that oh, issue on hold. Oh, hello? Yeah, yeah, sorry. I was just asking, okay. what's the problem with Quay? Why do we want to, to move to another uh, container registry? It's not move, it's just provide a, a, an additional registry so that we don't shut customers down. Um, I had uh, three community members that I was onboarding on that Monday that Quay went down. And uh, we got our Kubernetes instances online and um, time to install Kubert and we can't install because, because so we so it was yeah so we're talking about another registry yeah. to um, you know to, to go to when things go wrong in Quay exactly okay thanks so I'll I'll look into what CNCF can provide for us for. For GitHub, and then I'll, I'll report in on that issue. Sounds good. Okay. Okay, guys, uh, we're at 8 a.m. Um, let's uh, do a really fast goodbye and uh, and have a good week, and we'll we'll see you next week. See you. Thank you. Yeah. Bye. 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 Thanks. Goodbye. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Bye.